All right. So thank you so much for having me here today and inviting me here, Margarita and Matt. Um, I um, unfortunately had to decline my previous inv invitations. I was just too busy with teaching and, and my other postdocs. So I'm glad that I have some time now that I can share some of my graduate work. Um, and I have to say that I feel, um, uh, you know, slightly like a fraud here in a way because I haven't... Um, a studied analogy actively in a little bit, so I forgive uh, forgive me if I'm uh, a little bit behind on the literature. But um, this is a project that I did in graduate school with my advisor Dan Krosik, um at the University of Texas at Dallas, and um, it's a, it's a really cool project. And um, I'm going to present it uh, just focused on the one paper that we published during the pandemic. And so uh, here's the paper that we published in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. And uh, so if you have any specific questions, um, I'm happy to take them during the talk. Um, but and I guess my goal is for, for everybody to at least uh, read the paper <laughs> at the end. That's my goal here, to, to gather some interest here. So um, so authors on here were me, um, an undergraduate at the time, uh, Rudy Perez, and then also my graduate advisor, Dan. And so um, how this kind of paper was um, started was, uh, uh, we were thinking about a project that I was going to do as sort of a reasoning project. So I had already determined that I was going to do a, um, a project in traumatic brain in injury and executive functioning, but I really wanted to continue some of my analogy work that I had started in my undergrad with, um, with Bob Morrison. And so uh, Dan came to me with an idea about a phenomenon that he, that he observed in his reasoning class. Uh, but before I get to that phenomenon, um, I'd like to provide a little bit of a backstory. And this comes from um, a, a chapter in Holyoke and Thagard's Mental Leaps, published in 1995, um, that goes uh, through a series of match to sample uh, conditions. And so uh, in, the, in this basic match to sample task, uh, it's very simple, right? We give uh, participants or subjects in comparative psychology, so different species of animals, we can give them a sample uh, object and have them choose which of the best, uh, which of the alternatives on the bottom best match the sample relationally, All right? And here we have, uh, you know, this is quite an easy problem, right? We would, I guarantee all of us would probably pick this apple, all right? And so um, looking at different species of animal, this is very simple to do, right? Pigeons are successful at doing this task. Uh, crows are successful at doing this. Um, lower uh, primates are, are successful, as well as uh, chimpanzees. And so this just basic match to sample task has been observed um, through, throughout um, different species. It's quite easy to do. Now, after training um, so, um, certain animals on that original match to sample task, the kind of the, the goal standard to see if, if they're really matching things based on relationships or, or sameness of objects Right, is to do a transfer task and so to, to present different objects. So not just the apple that was presented before, but this time we have uh, hammers, right, and like a flower, right? And so here, for us, it'd be very trivial. We would say, okay, it's the hammer. It's the, the most obvious choice here, right? But surprisingly, that there's certain species that are unable to do this transfer task, right? So pigeons are unsuccessful at this. They're not able to recognize this object similarity and really will just only be able to be trained on that simple, um, the, the original object that was originally presented. Crows are able to do this. Um, lower primates are able to do this as well as chimpanzees. And so let's try to bump this in, in terms of relational complexity and introduce analogies uh, to this. And so here is the kind of the, the more complex version of the matched sample task, which is called the relational matched ta sample task. And so here we have um, now instead of just one stimulus, we have a pair of stimuli, and uh, and we're you know asked to uh, select which one of the two alternatives on the bottom best matches the top. And uh, for us again, it'd be very trivial to select that you know it's these hammers, right? So we we can see that these two apples are uh, are the same, and they are a lot. Uh, they share they share the same relationship as these two hammers on the bottom, right? And this is where it seems to be sort of a dividing line uh, among species. So again, the pigeons are not able to do this. Surprisingly, crows are able to complete this task uh, quite well. And so, uh, and they actually 
demonstrate spontaneous analogical reasoning, meaning that they don't really need a lot of training in order to um, generalize and transfer those um, analogical reasoning skills to other problems. Uh, lower primates are not able to do this task. They lack that ability to um, reason about relationships. And the famous um, chimpanzee trained by David Premack, uh, Sarah, was able to complete these analogies and solve them reliably, but only after um, being trained on a symbolic token-based language system. And so here we have kind of, and then for us, obviously humans, are, we were able to do analogies and, and it's no problem for us. Um, and so here is this dividing line, right? Now, if we take this, this problem, we increase the relational complexity one level higher, we get to a problem which kind of comes to this story about um, how my advisor, Dan Krawczyk, um, you know, would notice this phenomenon happening in his classes where he would teach his undergraduate reasoning class and present the following problem. Okay, so here's a relational match to sample task that increases that relational complexity one level higher. And so if you, if you would uh, be so kind to enter what you think in the chat is the correct answer, um, it, whether it's one on the left or two on the right. I'm gonna see if I can see any responses, if, any, if anybody's brave enough. Right, I'm getting some interesting responses. It looks like they're both wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, so we got some mixtures of ones and twos. And so, yeah, I mean, as we can see, just from looking at the chat responses, it's not really clear what the answer is, right? Um, there is no, I guess, one correct answer, but there's a deep answer to this. There's a, there's a way that we can appreciate this. And this is something that, um, that my advisor would observe in his classes as well, which is that, you know, there wasn't, it didn't seem like there was a clear consensus on what the correct answer should be. And so um, how the correct answer in, in that chapter in uh, Holyoke and Thagra would be this one on the left, um, this one with the shoe and the flower and the bottle and the bell. And so how, how is that the correct answer? How is that the deeper, more relational answer? And so here is a image in that chapter that kind of explains it. So instead of comparing it top to bottom, let's compare them side to side, right? So we have the apple um, is object, they, they share an object of sameness. A relationship there and then we have the hammers over here right so that would be the the, the kind of the, the sample that's being matched to and so the the two hammers share the same relationship so if you compare those relationships right we they, we, we realize that they have the same relationship now on the bottom here we have the shoe and the flower and they are different objects so the relationship is object differentness if we compare the bottle and the bell, they are also different objects. So if we compare those relationships, they have both the same relationship, right? And so here is this, this idea of a system mapping. It's an analogy of analogies. You're comparing the relationships between um, uh, analogies, right? And so that's why that's, you know, there's no really correct answer, but there's a deeper answer to that problem. So you might be thinking, well, this is highly abstract. You know, how, when are we ever going to be completing system mapping problems in daily life? And this is, that's a good question to ask, right? We want to make sure that when we're doing science, right, this is somewhat applicable to daily life. And so I would argue that we humans are able to do system mappings quite uh, readily, uh, and we do, them, we do them all the time. Oh, and by the way, it's not really known whether any of these species will be able to successfully perform the system map uh, probably not, um, uh, just because of the, the relational complexity and the working memory demands that this um, requires. But here, here's my example about um, stepping into the real world with system mapping problems. And so imagine that you're an educator and you're tasked with um, describing uh, Ohm's law to your class, right? And so we know that Ohm's law is um, the, the, the relationship between voltage and resistance and the circuit is equal to its um, current. And so we can explore some of the relationships uh, in that equation, right? And so often what's used to convey this is, uh, you know, electrical circuit. So we have some, we, we need a power supply, a battery of some sort, right? That's supplying a current to the system. And then we can um, uh, look at the, the effects on current at a specific, you know, modulation of resistance, right? We can 
um, use this kind of diagram to educate others about this concept. Now, this is kind of hard to convey because, you know, we don't have a lot of physical experience with electricity and circuits unless we have an oscilloscope handy. It's, it's hard to understand these concepts. So often we draw an analogy to this to help communicate. And so often uh, is you, uh, hydraulic system analogy is used. So instead of the power supply, we now have a water pump that's providing energy into the system. We have current flowing, we have water flowing through the system, and we can modulate um, you know, the, the width of the tubing or the pipes to demonstrate uh, changes in the current as a result of, of uh, changes in resistance. Now here we can see a nice analogy. It's, 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 uh, it's even, it even looks very similar to the circuit here, All right? And, but there's other sorts of, uh, there's another analogy that we could probably use for this, which is um, instead of a power supply and a water pump providing energy into the system, we could lift a bucket of water up in the air, which, which induces potential energy into the system. And that water will flow against gravity, or I'm sorry, with gravity down into a bucket. And we can modulate the resistance of that, of that tubing by um, using a sponge or something to impede the water flow. And we can understand that, you know, the, the, the differences in current as a, as a function of the resistance. Now, when, if you were to be tasked with educating a class with one of these two analogies, which one would you pick? Um, I'm just curious about the preferences of the audience, whether you'd pick maybe analogy one here on the left or uh, analogy two here on the right. There's no right answer. I'm just curious as uh, from the from the audience, which one you would pick. So please use the chat if possible. I think it would depend on the audience, on the kids as well, how old they were, perhaps. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, most people are pressing one or choosing one, right? But the fact that you have a preference, the fact that, oh, I think that you know, one. Is, is mapping closer, right, than number two, right? The fact that you're able to do that is you are comparing the relationships between those two analogies, right? You're able to uh, see the similarities and differences between those. And so we are doing system mappings in everyday life. And so understanding this process might help us understand intellect and some of the cognitive components that are um, involved in this process. Now let's explore some previous work that has attempted to understand the system mapping and um, analogy in, in humans. And so um, work done by Kroger, Holyoke, and Hummel in 2004, uh, they presented this task called the four square task. Uh, and here I'm showing grayscale objects, but um, they had used color. And so here they were looking at three different conditions. Uh, on an attribute level in which participants just had to basically see whether the, the square on the right had changed from the square on the left in, in terms of its attribute. So is an identical change or, 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 is, there, or is it the same um, colors? Now in the relation level, they were, instead of comparing the attributes of those, they were comparing the relationships. So, you know, did, were, was there a change in those squares where there's no change? And then here they were, they were just comparing those two relationships together. But in the system mapping, they were comparing the, the, the relationships of relations. And so here they were able to you know, identify whether there was a change in relationship or it was the same thing. And so they did a lot of work to train the participants on how to do this task. Um, they made sure that the stimuli were equivalent. They changed the delays. And overall, the results were um, similar in that as the relational complexity increased from attribute to relation to system mapping, we see that there is an increase in the reaction time, suggesting that there was, you know, took them, uh, took participants longer to process those more relational, relationally complex objects. Now, this was a good starting point, um, but what we were kind of interested in is, you know, the, if we didn't train individuals on this task, right, and we just had them perform um, attribute level, relation level, and system mapping problems intermixed with each other, would people, one, be able to figure those out from each other? And two, would people actually be able to understand the system level, uh, system mapping problems? And so our research questions were quite simple. One, um, with feedback, so if, if we, if after every single trial, if participants receive feedback on this task, can complex relational structures be learned, such as a system mapping problem? 
And also kind of a, um, a more specific question is, what are some of the unstructured learning rates of these complex relational structures, right? We saw that as from, from Kroger's work that, you know, as, as uh, complex relational structures increase in their complexity, uh, you know, it took more time to learn those or, you know, um, uh, compute those, you know, whether and verify whether there was a change or a difference. But if there were no instructions on how to do this, what would the learning rates, how would they differ between the between the different complexities. And so what we developed, um, which took a long time, uh, was this thing called the fractal task, which we're calling it. Um, it's a relational mash to sample task in a very similar format to the to what we what I was showing in the um, the Holyoke uh, textbook or the, the the chapter on the analogical ape where there's a system mapping analogy problems. However, this the stimuli that we used, uh, instead of semantic shapes like shoes and apples, we use a fractal-like images to reduce the semantic processing. And so uh, these are examples of these fractal-like images here on the right. They kind of look like shattered glass. Um, how I developed these was um, I adapted an algorithm published by Mia Shita and colleagues in 1991, um, that and I coded this in MATLAB to basically generate um, different sorts of shapes that were grayscale that would be very unique from one another. So uh, the code that if you're interested in these fractal images or fractal like images, you can see my GitHub where I have um, that posted there. Um, but the kind of the unique advantage of this is that every um, stimulus and every problem was presented as unique in, uh, images. So we didn't repeat anything. So everybody, every single trial was a unique trial. And so this was done to basically reduce the semantic processing. And we kept it simple. We have three conditions, um, perceptual analogy and system mapping problems. And I'm gonna show an example of each one of these in turn. So here's an example of a perceptual trial. Now I'm showing this on a white background, um, but the participants saw this on a black background and this dot dashed line here was is white instead. But it's a little bit easier to see these on a white background for a presentation. So that's why I did it this way. Um, if you if you look here, um, this is the sample here on the top, and these would be the alternatives on the bottom. And so for the perceptual trial, um, this one here on the right would be the correct answer because it's a perceptual match. And they would receive feedback that that would be the, you know, that's the correct answer when they would select it. So this is the one on the left here would be incorrect. Pretty simple. We just had two versions of this problem. Uh, we just counterbalanced that there was an equal chance that the correct answer was on the right side of the screen versus the left. Here's an example of an analogy trial. So in this case, uh, we have the sample again on the top, alternatives on the bottom. And how participants were supposed to solve this was that they were supposed to compare uh, between the rows. Excuse me. So right here is uh, in a comparison between whether the top row is the same or different than the bottom row. So in this case, um, these two rows are the same. The, this image here on the right, the top row differs from the bottom row, so that'd be a relationship of difference. And then again, on this, on the bottom right, we see that those two stimuli are the same. So the correct answer here would be on the right because they're based on the similarity of relationships. So they're both same. So the one on the right is correct. Now we had four different analogy types. So this is matching based on similarity. We also match based on similarity of differences. So instead of, um, so the, the sample could also be difference between the top and bottom row, and it would also have to match difference based on the top and bottom row, and then also counterbalance versus left and right. And so uh, the last problem would be the system mapping example. And so here is the sort of a, the same thing that I showed initially, um, with the system mapping problem, except that this is now using fractal-like images. So here, participants were, were now comparing not top and bottom of the row, but also between the two columns of images. So these two images here are the same. Uh, these two images here are the same. And if you compare their relationships together, they have a relationship of sameness. And as you'll see here, these two images are different. These two images are different. And if you compare the two relationships, they both have the same relationship of differentness. And so the correct answer here would be on the left. 
And so there are actually 32 different types of system mapping problems. So not only did we counterbalance for the correct answer being left and right, but we also counterbalance whether the different uh, images were on the top or the bottom of each one of these um, alternative choices. And so it ended up being 32 different system mapping problems, which is quite unique because there are only 32 system mapping problems present in the entire experiment. So technically, every single time participants encountered a system mapping example, it was a unique problem that they had never seen before. So th just to give you an idea of the trial procedure, uh, first we presented participants with a fixation cross that was jittered between 500 to 1,000 milliseconds. And then we presented a relational match to sample problem until uh, the participant entered a response, either the left or the right. And then uh, we gave participants feedback on every single trial. So this was presented for 500 milliseconds, simply just a green check mark if they got the problem correct and a red X if they got the problem incorrect. And then an inter um, trial interval for 500 milliseconds before the next trial started. So in total, we had four blocks, 24 trials in each blocks. There are 24 trials in each block for a total of 96 trials, and there are only eight problems of each condition per block, um, and the problems were never repeated, so unique problems every single time, and were pseudo-randomized, meaning they were randomized with, throughout the experiment, but each participant received the exact same order of problems. And sort of building on the Kroger work, we decided not to... Um, instruct participants or let them practice how to do these problems, but rather we were just interested in how they were able to figure this out on their own through the feedback scheme. So the instructions were very simple. It was just for experiment one. Um, in this experiment, you'll be shown three sets of images. One set of images will be shown at the top of the screen, while the other two sets will be shown at the bottom left and bottom right of the screen. And your job is to determine which of the bottom two sets best matches the top set of images. And that's all they were told, and they were allowed to just complete the task. And just a quick note about the statistics that I used. Um, I used multi-level modeling here. Um, I was really interested in the change over time and different ways to model that. So I modeled it both linearly um, with a quadratic function as well as a cubic function. And to keep um, the within subjects um, effects um, orthogonal, I kept the, I, I basically did a contrast between perceptual and analogy conditions. And then I combined the perceptual analogy conditions and tested them against system mapping. And so there would be interactions across all of these, uh, which generates a lot of results, uh, but it's, it's really interesting in what we found. And so let's go over experiment one first. Um, this is just a very basic experiment. We had 38 um, UT Dallas students. Um, that were just college students uh, participating. We had 14 men and uh, three left-handed individuals, about average age, about 21 years old. And so what I'm going to show you here is a plot of the mean proportion correct uh, for each one of the conditions. And what I'm showing this is across time. So as they got more familiar with the experiment, so this is um, across the four blocks here on the x-axis, and then mean proportion correct here on the y-axis with one being 100% accurate. Now you might see some of these, each, each one of these individual lines is a single participant. You might notice that some of these um, are above 100%, and that's just because there's a little bit of random noise introduced into this plot just to see that so the points don't overlap with each other. But generally what you'll see is that um, the perceptual matching condition uh, was basically near ceiling performance the whole time. Very easy condition. Everybody essentially understood that one. In the analogy condition, you see that it was off to a rocky start, but then participants basically plateaued around 80% um, throughout the rest of the um, experiment. However, the system mapping problems are quite problematic. As you see, participants started uh, pretty low in their performance and actually got worse over time uh, with more trials. And, and because we had two choices, you know, this is about 50% is would be chance performance. So participants were essentially at chance, which I don't blame them. It's, as you can see, it's a quite a difficult task. Um, but then there was a, a slight increase by block four. So perhaps they were understanding it by the end. And then for the, the correct, uh, correct reaction time, so the reaction time for only trials in which participants got correct, uh, we see that basically there's a general trend of you know, increase or uh, faster responses over time, 
uh, but it did take Parsons longer to uh, complete system and system mappings versus analogy problems. And so looking at these results, um, you know, we were kind of shocked. We, we didn't realize that um, the system mappings would be as hard, especially with feedback. Although there are 32 different, you know, system mapping problems, we thought that at least there'd be a linear increase uh, in performance across time. And so we, our next experiment that we ran was trying to um, encourage participants to, you know, improve that performance by specifically cueing them to um, pay attention to the relational properties of the, of the problems. And so we didn't change anything from the experiment except one additional line of instruction. And so in this next experiment, we had 72 participants that participated. Um, basically the same, um, uh, um, uh, I think actually this might be incorrect. I'm, I apologize for that. I think this is exactly the same from the previous slide, but that can, that's not possible. So please ignore that for, for the time being. Um, here's an additional line of instruction that we included, which was be sure to attend to how images are same or different, right? Just a slight extra line of instruction, but to basically make them attend to relational properties of the problem. Hopefully that would improve their, uh, their performance. And as we can see here, um, I'm plotting the mean proportion correct here on the top graph and their reaction time on the bottom graph. Um, as you can see, the perceptual matching is basically sealing performance the whole time. Um, System mapping and analogy performance is very similar at the first block, which is nice for comparison purposes, right? Because we, we can say that they basically start at the same point. Analogy looks nice, right? It's improving at a nice fast pace throughout the experiment. But again, we see the exact same shape, again, for system mapping problems, such that participants tend to get worse before they get better, um, even though they were attended, you know, they were cued to attend to a relational information. And a similar story here again for mean correct reaction time. And just so you can compare these side by side to each other, um, here is the graphs um, next to each other. So as you can see, very similar shape between system mapping problems for both experiments. Uh, I did model that specifically. Was there an effective experiment in any one of these conditions? And we do see an effect. It is small, but we do see um, an effect between perceptual and analogy problems. And so in experiment two, I'll remind you that that's where we gave that additional line of, of information. We see that there's actually an interaction here such that there's a steeper slope for the analogy problems compared to this perceptual matching problems. However, this has to be interpreted with caution because it does seem from this previous slide um, that those um, in experiment two actually start off with worse performance in analogy. So they may, may have had more room to grow or uh, more room to grow faster or improve in their analogy performance. And so that's one effect that we observe from a linear effect of, of block. Uh, but then if we look at reaction time, we see that there's actually a linear increase, right? So there's an interaction here between this such that individuals in experiment to improve that or responded at a faster rate faster across time. So this is the rate of change. Uh, however, there was actually a quadratic effect um, such that um, this, you know, this was a, more of an accelerated increase in reaction time um, across the blocks for experiment two. So that was in our attempt to kind of improve performance. However, if we plot, you know, we were still kind of disappointed that individuals weren't really doing that well on system mapping problems. And so, you know, we kind of wrote this off as, you know, individuals are just simply not performing well in the system mapping. They probably don't understand it, right? Maybe there's something that we need to do differently here. However, if we look at the raw data, so each one of these lines is a individual participant from both the experiments, you'll see that there is a subset of individuals who seem to be doing quite well at the system mapping problems by block four. You'll see that there are, you know, near 80 to some individuals getting all eight of those system mapping problems correct. Uh, and just to remind you, 50% would be chance performance. And so here are those individuals that I'm highlighting here using this visual um, circle and oval. And so we decided to perhaps take a look, take a look at the data in a different way by characterizing the difference in these performance types. And so those individuals that are performing uh, above chance, so essentially because there's eight system mapping problems in block four, we decided to split them up and anyone who got five of those problems or more 
um, on, on block force system mapping, we determine them to be high performers. And anybody underneath that, so chance or below, would be considered a low performer. And then we'd analyze that as a between subject effect and rather than experiment, because, because experiment didn't really have an effect on system mapping. So we decided to basically collapse across experiment and run the analysis using performers as a between subject um, variable. And so when we look at performance type, we have 60 low performers and 50 high performers across the two experiments. And those two groups did not differ based on their age or their years of education. And here, what I'm showing here is this global performance on the task between the two performance types. As we can see here, um, higher performers, right? They, they perform better on system mapping problems than the low performers. And we would expect that because that's how we, that's where we made our cut point basically on their block force system mapping um, performance. We would, we would expect them to be different there. But what was interesting is, you know, despite us separating them based on their system mapping performance, we do see that high performers are better at uh, analogy problems than those that are low performers, despite them having relatively the same perceptual matching. So it does seem that higher performers are better at analogies. And if we look at their reaction time, we can see that in general, higher performers are slower on the task. Um, they take their time when they're doing um, uh, system mapping problems. Uh, much, you know, they they are they're much slower at doing those than uh, low performers. So you might just think that, hey, this this is probably a, a, a speed accuracy trade off, right? And I'm going to argue in the next few slides that it's not a speed accuracy trade off. There's actually something deeper going on here. So if you look at the difference in performance types, um, this is a plot of proportion correct. Uh, looking at the contrast uh, between perceptual and analogy problems versus system mapping problems. And so we combine those together just because of how that, that's how the orthogonal contrast worked out in our, in our linear modeling. Those open circles and dashed lines are lower performers and the solid lines are the higher performers. As you can see, if we look at the perceptual analogy performance, um, you know, those that are that are higher performers are, you know, do better, but the rate of change over time is, is the same. Those, those are essentially parallel lines. Where they differ is uh, on their system mapping performance, right? So those that are higher performers, um, they actually do better uh, linearly across time. Those that are low performers are essentially um, operating at chance. However, a quadratic fit actually um, did much better at um, fitting these data. So a difference of about 14% of the variability. So technically, um, the, the instead of just have a monotonic increase over time, higher performers actually get worse at the task at system mappings before they improve. So they're, they perhaps are trying out different um, relational structures uh, throughout the task. They're a little bit more dynamic in their responding. And so perhaps that, um, you know, that's one strategy difference between the high and low performers. Now, if we look at reaction time, we interestingly enough, got, receive a cubic effect of time, right? So this kind of lends more to the story of there, you know, there's, there's more dynamic responding here from the higher performers. They're trying different things out, right? So their, their reaction time actually, imp, you know, it gets faster and then it slows down at block three and then it improves again at block four. So this is the reason why it's probably not a speed actually trade-off because block three is notoriously known as the block, you know, that is of the worst experience here, right? Their, their performance is much lower, but yet the reaction time is much slower in that, in that block. And so this, again, suggests that higher performers were more dynamic across the experiment and perhaps speed actually trade-off is not at play there. So why is block three, you know, block two and block three, you know, wh why is that such a difficult time point for those high performers, right? Or, or also with low performers. And so one theory that we had was that perhaps if individuals are taking this relational structure from the analogy problems and applying that to the system mapping problems, you know, they would, you know, how the problems were, were designed was if you were to do that, you'd perform a chance, uh, chance performance. And so the, the, the way to test this would be to do a correlation between the accuracies of perceptual 
and I'm sorry, not perceptual, uh, analogy and system mapping problems to see if there was um, a relationship there. So negative correlation would suggest yes, right? If you're getting better at your analogy performance, your system mapping should suffer in its, in its, um, in, in its accuracy. A positive correlation there would suggest no. So the better you are at analogies, the better you are at the system mapping. So that's what we did. We, we calculated the, the correlations between um, uh, these two conditions. And as we can see, both groups, uh, the solid line here are high performers across time and the dashed line are lower performers. And at the first block, you see that they're both positive correlations. But if anything, there's negative correlations, although they're not significant, the lower performers seem to be um, suggesting that they're, they're trying to use the analogy structure on top of the system mapping problems, which results in poor performance. The higher performers actually have a positive correlation here at block three, suggesting you know, the better that they, that they are at the analogies, the better that they are at the system mapping problems. So it's probably not that they are, they, they know that the analogies are different than the system mapping problem. They just, they don't understand the relational structure until later in block four. And so again, just to reiterate, this suggests that the analogy condition did not interfere for the high performers. Now we, at the time, we were also studying um, uh, traumatic brain injury and executive functioning. And so we had access to a lot of neuropsychological tests as well as some other analogy assessments that we were able to run in addition to the fractal experiment. And so we ran um, a visual spatial working memory scale called the symbol span which basically just has participants, you, you know, you view um, these non-semantic shapes and then you're, um, you're given a five second delay and you're asked to point in order of the images that you saw. And so this is a, just a measure of visual spatial working memory. We have a task of extraction in working memory. So just there are, this is a sort of like a task with different relational rules that are applied to these non-semantic shapes. And you're supposed to um, uh, just match the ones that you think and you get feedback from this as well. There's also a working memory component where um, these structures go away and you have to do this um, across a delay as well. And then we also um, used a verbal analogies task um, that was published uh, by Lara Jones, who spoke um, earlier this year on this task uh, at the seminar. Um, and, and as we know that in this task, there was um, uh, verbal analogies that differed based on the semantic distance between the source and the target, as well as the distracting elements uh, of the of the alternative uh, options, but instead of using those different conditions, I just simply looked at the global um, score, the global performance on verbal analogies. And we had one last task that we used, which was uh, a CNN analogies task called the Similar Situations Task, developed by um, Dan Krosik. And and here um, we present participants with a scene um, that has. Uh, various arrows pointing to different uh, objects in that scene and participants are given an opportunity to encode the scene and the different roles and so here we have um, an individual here stealing a phone from this woman who's laying down and then uh, or sitting down on this table and then we have this bunny here that's um, hopping over a bush and so there's a delay period and then participants are um, given the opportunity to click on one of the objects in this in this um, target scene that best matches one of the relationships here in um, the sourcing. And so here the correct answer would actually be, since this woman is getting the phone stolen by this man, um, this dog here is um, getting a frisbee stolen by this dog. So this would be the correct answer in this. So you can see it's kind of a difficult task. Uh, there's a lot to encode and remember and hold during delay, but various um, relational and working memory tasks that we, that we did. So if we look at the performance between the two groups, high and low performance across all these tasks, uh, with no surprise, um, higher performers um, perform better at, at these tasks of um, relations and working memory um, than those that are low performers on the fractal task. So we think that attention to and the maintenance of this relational information, especially across delays, you know, evoking working memory is an important distinguishing element between these two groups. Okay, so thank you so much for uh, bearing with me through all that. Um, so let me just go over uh, what are the conclusions from this experiment. So, um, so we think that performance on non-semantic relational match to sample tests are quite variable, uh, even in college students. We were really surprised that um, the system mapping problems didn't really um, improve 
um, as much for, for those. Um, and then we saw that actually there's two, two different groups there. Um, instructions that highlight the need for relational comparisons seem to not work for the system mapping problems, but they do work for analogies. And so it might be a, um, a useful strategy when trying to get people to think analogically. And we think that working memory uh, is probably lar largely contributes to one's ability to learn and understand these complex relational structures through feedback. You know, having to kind of um, keep in mind all these different relationships and how they differ from each other, and as, as well as be adaptive to those, right? As we saw in the, throughout the middle of the experiment, different strategies weren't working for some of the high performers, but that didn't mean that they weren't going to try different things in block four and get those correct. And so I wanna say thank you again, uh, especially to my graduate advisor, Dan Krawczyk, as well as um, uh, who Rudy was, was an undergraduate at the time, helped me out trying to figure out this fractal task, how, to, how we're gonna make the fractals, how we're gonna position them on the screen. I do what a wonderful honors thesis on this project um, when he was an undergraduate at University of Texas at Dallas. So, you know, very grateful for him helping out on this project. Um, all the experiments, the fractal experiments and all the code are available on my GitHub. If you'd like to um, go visit that, all the images are there in case you wanna use them. And I have my contact information there on the bottom right. So uh, this work was done at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, it's been a while since I've been there, but um, nevertheless, um, thank that institution for supporting this work. So thank you.